Hello, my name is Dave Kolb. I'm the police chief at the Champlin Police Department and welcome to Public Safety Talk. And I'm joined by some fire chiefs here. Uh, to my left is Chief Charlie Thompson from the Anoka Champlin Fire Department. And then Chief Dean Kapler, fire chief for the city of Ramsey. And Chief Jerry Strike, fire chief for the city of Andover. So gentlemen, uh, welcome. Thanks for having me host today. Thank you. Thanks um, for being here. Sir host. We've been talking a little bit about, about service and public safety service and police service and fire service. And so, you know, kind of on that theme, let's talk a little bit about service. Um, I've heard people say, well, gee, you know, over the last decade or two or three, there are fewer fires out there, right? And I think that's largely due to the inspections and some of the preventative services that you provide, but you're still providing a lot of services. It's not like, gee, there's no fires, so you're sitting in the station all day. So mm -hmm. let's talk about some of those services and how they've changed over the years and maybe some areas where there's more service needs than there used to be. Uh, Chief, let's talk about Andover, or Chiefs, really. Let's talk about Andover and Ramsey because those are changing communities, right? They. Mm -hmm were bedroom communities and now they're really starting to grow. So, um, Dean, let's maybe start with Ramsey. Let's talk about the changes in Ramsey and things you've seen there that change sure, the service. Sure, Dave. Uh, I would uh, offer that, uh, you know, since uh, Ramsey Fire was initiated in the late 1980s, there were very few calls for service back then during the week during the day, during the week, uh, because most of our population, the, the little bit that there was back then, got up and, and left. But through time, uh, we're getting more people there, we're getting some big employers in there, so not only are we uh, providing employment for our residents, but we're also bringing in that crowd from outside our, our borders, and uh, now, it's exactly the opposite. Our daytime response is substantially higher than our, our night and, and weekend response. Businesses, and and not just fire calls, but inspections, I'm assuming? Sure. Businesses. Well, and as our uh, commercial <coughs> industrial base grows, we, we feel it's important to stay in there and, and be, uh, uh, you know, preaching that, that preventative yeah. message that, that you just brought up a, a minute ago. And I do believe, like, like you said, uh, that the uh, product of that is uh, fewer fires yeah. down the line. I think people can take it for granted, gee, there, we haven't heard of a fire for a long time, but there's a lot of other things you guys do. Mm -hmm. um, Jerry, let's talk about Andover. Changes there as well? Yeah, a lot of changes in Andover, much like uh, all the cities in the area, but I, I remember as a kid going down uh, Bunker Lake Boulevard and seeing nothing but tires and junkyards, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, today there's a super uh, target there, a Walmart, uh, the sheriff's office, all kinds of big box stores to incorporate with the homes that were no, weren't there years ago. And Andover has over 10,000 homes uh, in their community and growing still. And the majority of the fires that occur today that we see are in homes, um, but a lot of changes. And like you said earlier, uh, we're no longer taking cats out of trees and going to fire calls. We're turned into the Swiss army knife of the community. And if you don't know who to call, Right. Give us a call and we'll figure it out. That's what we do in the police service. If we don't know what to do, we, we call the fire department. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Charlie, let's talk about your, now in your case, it's cities, not just a city. You, you have a fire department that serves Anoka and Champlin. That's correct. Um, and by the way, speaking of changing communities, now Anoka, I would assume, is kind of the older city of all the ones represented here, right? The it old is. river town. So what have you seen in terms of changes and maybe even how, how are your two cities different? The largest changes I've seen were probably implemented by us. I don't think early on when I first came here about 10 years ago, we had as an aggressive inspection program as we could have had. And you hit on it a little bit. Uh, we do it very aggressively now. And the other piece of that is uh, public safety education. Um, we, we'll field anywhere from five to 6,000 um, public safety contacts in a year and I feel that that's a significant amount and when you're uh, when you're actually having contact with that many people and it, it's a fair estimate but a lot of it's based on actual people coming through the uh, through the uh, uh, fire departments themselves or the events we've been at you're going to reach people out, out there so that that in my perspective has changed and what does it change it's changed some of the calls that we go on um, the fire inspections has certainly changed some of the calls that we would, uh, if, if we missed an inspection or didn't do an inspection, maybe uh, ins uh, 
you know, uh, cords being plugged in multiple, having fires from that perspective in businesses and going out there and educating um, businesses. I, I, the call volume has certainly been reduced by those efforts and the public fire safety piece, now we're hitting the residents out there, three structure fires this year and I'm, I'm talking about outside sheds, that's gonna be significant for us this year. Now can that change tomorrow? We all know that that can, but I truly believe there's pieces that uh, that prevented some of the, the issues that we've seen in the past. And, and yet, whether you have 10 structure fires or one structure fire, when there's a fire, you need the personnel you need, you need the equipment that you need. So I, I've heard people suggest, well, there's fewer fires, you could have fewer trucks or fewer firefighters. I'm sure they feel that way until their house is on fire and suddenly they want all those resources there. And so you do maintain a lot of equipment still, a lot of people. We do and we have to, you just uh, you just nailed it perfectly. We need, the average amount is 15 firefighters per, um, per fire scene. Well, uh, we usually get on a paid on call department one firefighter for every three that you have. So if you have 30 firefighters, you might get 15. Now we're gonna cover this topic here shortly, but put that during the day when all your firefighters are out working someplace. And I think um, some of the questions coming up here are going to uh, hit that specific piece, but uh, yeah. Um, and when you say paid on call firefighter, maybe for the audience, that's what many of us used to call the volunteer firefighter. That's someone who gets called when there's an emergency and they come in, right? That's correct. Uh, again, you, you, you've got it perfectly. We used to call them volunteers. There's still volunteers in the state, but because we pay them per call, they actually get a wage. And the second piece is they get a retirement if they make it through a specific amount of years. It's more of a second job to uh, these firefighters than in, in the day of the volunteer. We just volunteered our time. We may or may not have gotten a pension and most of the time we didn't get paid. And you all draw those firefighters from your communities? Mm -hmm. Yes. And with the changes going on, demographic changes, has that become more difficult, less difficult? I don't know your individual experiences, Jerry. Uh, I, I believe it's more difficult. Unfor or fortunately, we draw from Coon Rapids and we get to draw from Ham Lake as well because our station's close to the border and we have a response time. But just finding anyone to respond in the daytime, we're talking about changes in the community. A lot of people are leaving the community in order to work. So now uh, we don't have that pool to come in and, and the city of Andover is big discussion right now, which we'll get into later, but um, we're, we're, we have maybe five to seven actual daytime personnel outside of the two that are at the fire station. And as uh, Chief Thompson said, statistically we need 15 people to establish an a, a aggressive attack, meaning an incident commander, safety officer, inside team, outside team, those kinds of things, pump operators. And uh, until we get that number, it's, it's risky. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we need to set up and have the amount of people to make an aggressive attack interior, in, from the interior. Otherwise, we're gonna make it from the exterior until, until Anoka shows up and Ramsey shows up in the daytime. Uh, we rely on each other every day. I was gonna say, that's, that's part of the solution here, right? right? As you part share. of the solution. Yeah. Right. If I might add, uh, one other element that I think all three of us deal with is the world's a changing place. You know, 20, 30 years ago, it was, it was nothing for someone to be employed at the same employer. They're basically their career. Right. Now, people are changing jobs more frequently. They're changing states more frequently. It, it, it's nothing to, to uh, get a job offer on the West Coast and, and be relocated there. Whereas that's something I believe the fire service, again, 20, 30, 40 years ago, just didn't deal with that. They, they had a more uh, a stabilized Stable. mm -hmm. uh, community to pull those people from. So it, it's really a challenge. So for new members of, of all of our communities who may be watching this, something to consider to help out your community. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. And, um, obviously, to be a firefighter, you have to be good looking, <laughs> with, yeah, you're with some exceptions, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but is there anything else really you're looking for in a, in a paid on call person? They don't necessarily have to have experience with this? That's true. No, no experience necessary. In fact, sometimes it's better that we're mm -hmm. allowed to train you from scratch. So uh, other habits don't come into our training process and procedures. but. Um, uh, you know, we want somebody that's going to stay in the community and serve. In our community, it costs about $8,300 to just equip somebody to get on the truck and respond when you include training into that. So that's a lot of money. 
Uh, so to come on board and then leave in a year or two really isn't fiscally uh, mm -hmm. responsible for our community. So we're looking for people that are willing to give that ultimate service because it is the ultimate way to serve, uh, but but hang around with us for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's it's certainly something people shouldn't be intimidated by if they have some interest. Absolutely. Contact any of your cities. And yeah, absolutely. Sure. Yeah, we're always hiring. So let's talk about uh, a, a specific thing we mentioned earlier, we were talking about before the show, was something called target hazard. And I think uh, all of your cities have this, but um, Jerry, we just left off with you, but you want to kind of give a bit general description of what that means? And sure. What you know, we talk about service. How do, how do we determine the level of service we need? We, we, we focus on our target hazards. What are the community risks? And those community risks then drive, for example, a ladder truck. We have a four-story uh, senior housing center. How are we going to get Mr. and Mrs. Smith off the balcony? We shouldn't do it by a 30-foot ladder. That's risky. Mm -hmm. um, getting over over the peaks of the structure, you know, those kinds of things. So target hazards really one of those areas in our community that can create risk. And then how are we going to mitigate the risk? And sometimes it requires tools or additional people or additional training or skill. Dean, do you have some specific target hazards in your community? Well, I think we all have uh, larger em employers in, in our community. And I think anytime you get larger groups of people in, they could be considered a, a, a target uh, kind of thing. Uh, certainly, uh, the, the two of us, and uh, Andover also has a rail going through, but uh, Anoka oh. and uh, Ramsey has a very busy rail going through with the uh, Bakken oil field as active as it is. I consider that just a, a major uh, mm -hmm. uh, sure. target issue right now, and uh, it and it's a moving one. Obviously, yeah. it, 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 you really have no feel for where something's at one time or another. I guess the comfort I have is knowing if something does go wrong. It, it's not going to, if it happens in Ramsey, it's not going to be a Ramsey issue. We're going to be calling in a regional force to come sure. in and take care of that. And my, my, my two friends on either side of me are, are going to be right in the front, front line with that. Charlie, that reminds me of the big disaster scenario that you put together years ago, and that was rail based. Mm -hmm. And I think Correct. you had firefighters from all over the place showing up to help with that. We did. In fact, uh, these gentlemen here were key players in planning the entire. Um, the, the entire drill, and I, I believe you were part of it as well, Dave, in the beginning, but we focused, we, we started at the beginning as a risk analysis. We looked at the city and, and looked at what what is the most uh, high risk, low re frequency event that we had there, and we looked at the rail, and then the increase in the Bakken oil. It's not just the Bakken oil that go down those tracks. Most people don't know this, but there are other things that do go down the tracks that we really do need to be concerned And about. in that scenario, you had a passenger train involved as well. We did. We yeah. had a North Star passenger train. And I think the best part of that whole planning process was we had Burlington Northern and uh, the North Star technical people involved in the planning piece. And they gave us some very good realistic ideas when we were doing the planning piece to that. Mm -hmm. So. We came up with a scenario in their mind which very easily could have occurred and that was one train going one way, a piece sticking off a, a car train hitting another train and it disrupted both of them, causing a chemical issue. So we had a, a lot of things going on there. We had to put together a large scale incident command. We knew we had a hazmat. We knew we had a police and fire issue. Uh, law enforcement needed to do their perimeters and set up a an isolation area, um, do their evacuation piece. Uh, we had an EMS issue, and uh, we just had to take all those pieces and try to train everybody on exactly how we would react to it. And in the end, I think we learned some really, really valuable pieces to that when we put the after action uh, report together. There were some major communication issues that we worked on with Burlington Northern, and from my, uh, from my input or the information I've received, they've corrected the way they report those because we went quite a span before the initial, the initial uh, incident was reported through them. That was our goal. We wanted to t test their communication piece. So let's, let's pick up on that. Let's take a quick break, and let's come back to that drill, and then we'll get into some other topics. We'll be right back on Public Safety Talk. problem. That 
was the most irresponsible. This aggression will not stand, man. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm not sure what's about to happen next, but we're already off to a really bad start. And this situation is only going to escalate. So let's back up, figure out what could have been done differently to avoid this. Sixty-six percent of traffic fatalities are caused by aggressive driving. If you witness somebody who's driving aggressively, don't take it personally. Take a breath. Think about this, calm down, that'll get your heart rate lower and you'll better control your emotions. Also, don't engage with people by staring at them, looking at other drivers, or responding to their provocative behavior. They might just be trying to get a rise out of you. Be the level-headed person, be the smart person. Remember, half of drivers who get provoked are going to respond with their own aggressive behavior towards you. And do you really want to be stuck now in that confrontation? And statistically, an increasing number of these incidents involve a firearm. And do you want to be stuck in that kind of a situation? Stay smart on the road. Keep in mind the potential consequences. It's not worth winding up in prison or worse yet, dead. See you out there on the road. Welcome back to Public Safety Talk. Uh, Chief Thompson, you were talking there about this big disaster drill that you conducted a couple of years ago. Was it two years ago, three years ago? It would have been two years ago, I believe. And, uh, it, and it sort of fit into what we're calling about target uh, hazards, right? Where you identify these things that could happen in your community and then practice how you're going to practice and plan how you're going to respond to those things, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So um, I think. The takeaway that I took from that was that people in this community really should sleep a little bit easier at night knowing you're, you're, you're getting ready for those things. Hopefully they don't happen. Um, I don't think I've ever seen that many fire vehicles in one place at one time, but it's good to know they could get there. So, mm -hmm. so let's switch gears a little bit, gentlemen. I have a list of, um, of equipment issues that, that some of your departments are facing. And you know, we've talked about personnel and we've talked about practicing and training and getting ready for some of these events. But um, the other piece we really haven't talked about is the equipment it takes. Mm -hmm. um, firefighters are very capable, but without the equipment, of course, there's not much you can do. So uh, if my notes are correct, um, Chief, in Ra City of Ramsey, you're looking at building a new fire station? Let's talk not about that. Dave, not only looking at building it, it's, it's uh, coming out of the ground, it's reaching skyward. Uh, we're planning on completion. Uh, there, there's a chance at the end of 2015, more likely the first quarter of 2016. Uh, this isn't a new, uh, uh, an additional building, it's a replacement Replacing building. Replacing an old one. Uh, we, we still operate a fire station out of the old city hall uh, in, in Ramsey. Uh, that property, uh, which is, is quite a few acres there, has been sold to a single family home developer. Uh, so they're developing it in two phases. They've already started the first. Obviously, we need a place to stay until the new building's done. And again, we're, we're focusing on that first quarter of 2016 to take occupancy of that. And a fire station isn't any longer just a building you park fire trucks in, right? There's a lot of other things going on in there, I, I think. Maybe you can Sure. Well, those. a couple of things. Uh, we, we wanted to make this as versatile as, as we could. Our police department is going to have a substation there. Our uh, police chief is a big believer in keeping his resources. Uh, you know, we have a, a central police station that's sort of skewed to the west in, in our yeah. community. And what he doesn't want is to have his police officers, when they're doing their administrative tasks, to have to travel all the way over. He wants to keep them in, in, right. in the area there. So uh, we have included that, and we've also included the uh, ambulance bay, Great. too. And uh, I might add that uh, this is going to be our backup EOC, because our, our primary EOC is about a, uh, a sand wedge from the railroad tracks that we just talked about here. So if there was ever an issue in that area with the railroad, we may very well not uh, have uh, uh, 
availability. E- EOC that. being your emergency operations. I'm center, sorry. Right? Yes. So fire service all I, acronyms I, these days. I yeah. hear you. Emergency operations center. That's where, as a community, we we would basically run the uh, emergency operations out, out of the city. If there was yeah. a big disaster, mm-hmm. and of course, if the big disaster is on the rail line. Mm-hmm. That's going to take out your primary EOC. It, it so, may very well. So this would be your backup. Yes. So obviously that was well planned. A lot of thought went into. Mm-hmm. Okay. Jerry, let's talk about Andover. Um, new ladder truck. That's yeah. That's exciting. Now is that in the works or? Is so that- ladder truck's in service. It's been in service for uh, eight months now. It was a, a ten-year plan for the city to plan for this truck because it's expensive. You know, technology really drives our fire engines and equipment today, and that gets expensive. And the reason for the drive in the technology is safety. Mm-hmm. So uh, years ago, we could take a ladder truck and we could overextend it and put too much weight on it, and the truck would tip over. Today, the technology doesn't allow it even to get close to that. Mm-hmm. So that drives up a lot of the cost. So yeah, Andover has a, a new ladder truck. Different than the what I what I'll call a stick ladder, just straight stick ladder that we had. This one has a bucket on the end, an aerial platform, allows us to perform rescues, allows the the fire department or firefighters to work safely in a confined space and uh, snapped in. We can lift with it and go below grade and that kind of stuff. But yeah, that's uh, that was a significant uh, purchase at 1.1 million dollars for the community, but well planned, uh, and then it's a significant training issue is to uh, consider the models that we have which are all on-call firefighters and now train them to use a million dollar piece of equipment sure. mm-hmm. there's a lot of training required and a lot of trust and the and the and the ladder truck is that the largest vehicle that you deploy yes okay yeah wow. so and and if you look at the ladder truck it's a hundred a, a, let's just say it's a hundred foot truck and we get a lot of questions well what do you need a hundred foot truck for you don't have a 10-story building but that isn't the purpose of our ladder truck. It's more for reach, because right now we do not have the ability, unless we climb on a ladder, to get to the peak of a roof, which is unsafe. So we deploy it over the house or over the structure to try to get the water into the peak of the roof. And all of you have ladders, so, mm-hmm. so it isn't uncommon. And so with that sort of equipment, you could conceivably save a larger portion of a building that's starting to burn or I mean it it seems like a lot of money when you say a million dollars but we yeah. think about the value of property in the community and, and the property safe, fire right and yeah. it isn't uncommon for Ramsey is the lightning capital of Anoka County yes so well, you are. get a lightning strike in an attic the only way for on a roof the only way for us to really fight that fire is to go inside the house and tear all the ceiling down mm-hmm. to try to get it which is a bull work or to get that stick up above it, cut a hole, and put the water in. And and, uh, we no longer have to put people on the roof Mm -hmm. uh, with the lightweight construction and not knowing how long it's been burning under there and, you know. Seasonal issues. Seasonal, yeah, right, for snow. Because in addition to getting that fire put out and perhaps saving that building, you've got to think about the safety of your personnel as well. Safety is a priority concern, right. Uh, Charlie, let's talk about your, uh, I, I was going to call them toys, but they're not really toys, but you no, have a couple of uh, different sort of vehicles that you're looking at. Can you tell us about those? Yes, the two newest vehicles that we have are actually boats, and um, we uh, ordered a 21-foot uh, boat for the city of Champlin because they take the uh, Mississippi River. Well, we, we actually cooperate. We go to the, both sides, we'll go to the Ron Moore, Mississippi, but the need to... Uh, the need was for that larger boat on, on the Champlain side, and then we ordered a 17-foot uh, jet propulsion boat for the Anoka side. The jet propulsion boat, um, the jet won't stick below the transom, and the transom will be, the water table on that should be anywhere from six to eight inches, so that boat should be able to go virtually anywhere on So some really unique needs for your department. You've got the Mississippi River and the Rum River, kind of two different bodies. They're both rivers, but really different bodies of water. Correct. And Anoka and Champlain really span both of those. Yes. The other piece is, uh, you know, uh, both cities are exploring and uh, encouraging the use of the river shore property. As you know, the crossings here in Champlain, they're doing some major, uh, major planning to open that up to increase water traffic. The, uh, the five-story on uh, Dayton Road, 
that will actually have water access to it. So the, both cities have been encouraging uh, the use of increased water traffic. And you know, you were at the meeting last night, they were talking about a shared river boat. Yep. With those things in mind, uh, and having somewhat of a vision on our needs as a department, as we get called to those water emergencies more often, we looked really closely at this 21-foot uh, boat. Now, and, no and just as an example of a water emergency, just maybe two weeks ago, we had a boat crash on the river that, that your firefighters came out with both boats, I think. Correct, we had both boats. Really helpful in containing the scene and, and even, I think, towing the, the boat to shore and, and so. Assisting the, uh, yeah, water Assisting patrol. Assisting the water the, patrol. Yes. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about, and that's where I, 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 I like to call them toys because I tease you about how much you, this equipment that you have and, and whatnot, but it was kind of a serious incident that led to this change with these boats. Maybe you can talk about that one. Well, it was after we had what I call a near miss, and that was assisting Ramsey on their uh, their issue in the water. It was a couple of years ago. They had an SUV go in the water, and they called us for mutual aid. We deployed both of our boats, and it was really early in the morning. I want to say about 1.30 in the mm -hmm. morning, something of that nature. Exactly. Dark, cold. Dark. Ice in the cold. water. It was yes, it was all the above, and it, and. I, I guess the perfect storm of conditions, if you will. Now, currently we have a 17-foot Lund fishing boat on, at Station 1 in Anoka, and then we have a 12-foot Zodiac rubber boat. And that's sort of an inflatable craft, right? It's, it's an inflatable craft, And that's the yes. one you had a problem with? Yes, about 100 yards from shore, and, and, and understand that it's completely dark out and they had very limited visibility, something, and they didn't know what, I, I, we don't know to this day what, hit the side of the boat and ripped over a one foot gash in the side of the boat. Well, everybody on board that boat had their survival suits on. Was it a concern? It always is. In the middle of the night in a river, you just don't know. And the boat was literally sinking. The boat was submerging, yes. And these now, guys, even with the suit on, if they get in that water and the current's going downstream in that darkness, that's going to be, now we're going to be rescuing firefighters. If you even know they're in there, because <clears throat> yeah. the way our communication systems were set up, they may or may not have been able to get a hold of someone. Because the radio would hit the water. And, in the hand. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, so a, a very serious incident, and I think that kind of comes back to what Jerry was talking about is protecting your personnel is right. one of the, the priorities here. And so what I saw was you talking to both of your cities, the fire board, about the serious need for some better equipment and thus you get these new boats coming. Right. I, I talked to them about the incident, uh, showed them what we had for a budget and they directed me to go out and, and find. And in credit to both city councils, I know they're always very concerned about expenses and these are not cheap boats you're buying, no. but when put in perspective of a couple firefighters in some serious danger, clearly they stepped up and did the right thing. So They did. I certainly want to commend them for that. Mm -hmm. So. Anything new going on, gentlemen, before we break or call it a day here? Well, I guess I'd just like to maybe uh, uh, sort of go back to uh, new people. You know, we're all looking for, for people. Basically, we recruit on an annual basis. And uh, I, I like the way you put it. Don't, don't be scared off by, by you know, some of these uh, issues we talked about here. Uh, I, I think we provide excellent training to our people. We have a countywide uh, training academy we've talked about in earlier programs. Uh, you know what, we, we, we need good people and we're constantly out there looking for them and uh, boy, just contact any one of the departments here if, if you have an interest there because we're looking more for a personality than a skill set because we'll give them the skill set. Sure. Men and women? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Age age range for firefighters? Have to be at least 18. Okay. Uh, our department ranges from 19 to 72. Wow. I think I saw your your recruiting people at the state fair. Was mm -hmm. that in Oka County? Yeah, that was fire hire. Yep, that's mm -hmm. that's that uh, county wide effort. Yeah. yeah, great. Okay, well, thank you, gentlemen. Good conversation. Yes, appreciate you having me here. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you, Dave. We'll see you next time on Public Safety Talk. <laughs>